Hooray! I just picked up a background chapter from the printer. Woohoo! Hooray! Right, so before I get to talking about this literary masterwork, I should probably mention that if you didn't see it, I went to Vienna to present my work along with Tom, my colleague who sits over there. We gave oral presentations on our research and uh, unexpectedly also presented our supervisor's work at a poster session. Um, and then I was on a bunch of panels about social media and filmmaking. Uh, that's all in one vlog. I resisted the urge to make it like five videos along in a series because let's face it, my life's not that interesting. And since I came back, I've basically been exclusively working on this. I, I say that actually, um, in the aftermath of the conference, I had several days where I just had to do absolutely nothing because I was I put in so much work. It was it was like a, this, this um, increasing function of work that went into my PhD, and then I presented it, and then I just crashed for a bit because I was just totally burned out. Um, hopefully, other PhD students have had this before, and it's not just me. But I just had to take time off for my sanity. But since then, I've been writing this background chapter. So. Um, Theses are typically five, six, seven chapters long, and they're normally between 150 and 250 pages-ish, say. Um, which means that given all the other guff that you have, like your bibliography, uh, list of figures, glossary, title stuff, all the, the stuff that you kind of have to put in because of university, each chapter is normally about 25 to 30 pages long. Um, so they're pretty meaty works. And this is my... That's going to be out of focus, isn't it? Well done, Simon. This is my background chapter. So this is the second chapter in the thesis, even though it says one. I haven't rendered the whole thing yet. Um, uh, this is basically uh, the first chapter is, um, at least in my case, it does vary from person to person. Um, you kind of introduce your problem. You're saying this is what research topic I'm looking at. The second, top, the second chapter is much longer, and it goes through all the background. And because... Um, you're effectively summarising, in my case, the earliest reference I have is um, 1881. So I'm effectively summarising, you know, 130 years of science, in some cases trying to represent arguments for and against different points um, without losing any accuracy. Doing that in an engaging way that isn't just dry and boring is really hard. So this has taken me the best part of a month to write. It was actually technically not the first time I tried to write it. At the start of the PhD here at Exeter, we're asked to do a literature review. Um, which is meant to really form the basis of your background chapter of your thesis. So it's like in the bank, it's done from an early point. But I ignored that completely and started again, because uh, the direction of my thesis has changed slightly. So um, uh, this was kind of from scratch. And it's a pretty meaty one. This is um, it's just shy of 25 pages at the moment. Um, there's a still one or two figures missing, and there's one section I haven't quite finished yet. Um, I'll get to that in a second. So it's... Um, it's doing pretty good. It's, uh, for a first draft, I'm pretty happy with it. Um, I haven't shown it to my supervisors because I don't want that much red ink on it just yet. But, yeah, I've, I've, there's, there's one section here where I haven't actually bothered to convert a bunch of terms in this equation, so it's just heating over stability. Need to look up what that should be. And like I said, there's a section at the end where I have bits that just say, don't understand this, to be honest, uh, and don't talk about this, uh, where I need to finish it off. But I'm not going to finish it now because I am sick to the back teeth of this bloody thing. Because it's so dense uh, and hard to write, I mean, for goodness sake, there's close to 100 references in this already, and there's going to be more. It's probably going to touch 150 references in the whole thesis. Um, it, it's, it's a really hard thing to write. And doing it, allow me to really think about what I'm doing in the rest of my thesis. So it's allowed me to think about what I'm, what variables like PV mean, um, what the plan is for what I'm doing, and it's allowed me to form my head a really crystal clear plan of what I'm going to do, which I then couldn't do because I was busy writing the bloody thing. So I had a meeting with my supervisors yesterday where I just said, you know what guys, this is as good as you're getting for the time being. Um, screw this, I'm going to do some real science now, to which they kind of went, well, yeah, it's, it's fair and understandable. So I can ignore this and get back to real work. So, with that in mind, in this video, what I wanted to talk about was um, the main variable, really, that I'm working with in my thesis and is used a lot in stratosphere and atmospheric sciences generally, which is called potential vorticity, or PV for short. Now, the last PhD watch video, I talked about PV inversion, and um, I think I went a little bit in at the deep end. I didn't go give you guys a primer about what the variable actually means. Um, to recap from last time, I basically said that PV inversion is like if you um, know the position of the uh, football on uh, a football field and uh, maybe a few other bits of information, you can work out what the position of the players are. That's a process that's like 
PV inversion where the position of the ball is your PV distribution, where the PV is in the atmosphere, and the player's positions are the wind. But what does PV itself actually mean? Let's, let, let's go to the cast science whiteboard. That's the one. But doing a PhD, you forgot the word for whiteboard. I think I might have been pushing it a bit hard this week. I found a whiteboard. This room's actually really cool, by the way. This is in the um, university building I'm in. This entire room is panelled with whiteboards, so you can write on any surface. Uh, you might get in trouble for writing on some of them because some of them aren't whiteboards. But all the walls are whiteboards. So the usefulness of PV comes from um, an idea called balanced flow. And this is the idea that in the atmosphere, the uh, flow, and by that I mean the velocities, flow generally refers to fluid moving. So it could be ocean currents, it could be wind in the atmosphere. In the atmosphere, we have what's called a balanced flow, which means that the flow, the velocity, the wind speed, is uniquely determined by the distribution of mass in the atmosphere. Now, that might sound a little bit removed, but the idea is that by having, by knowing at any instant what the, um, where the mass is, which effectively means where the pressure is, you know, what the pressure is throughout, this, not just at the surface, but throughout the atmosphere, there is only one set of velocities that will come from that configuration. That's the idea of a balanced flow, that at any instant, all you need to calculate the velocities at that instant is the mass distribution at that time. Now, the way that you get the uh, velocities from your pressure distribution, because we relate the mass and the pressure by what's called a hydrostatic relation, which, oh, I can use a pen. That's too small. Which looks like this, and by the way, I'm still working on how to get my font size consistent. In order to get from your pressure, your mass distribution, to your velocities, you use what's called a balance relation. Now, there are different balance relations that work to different levels of accuracy. So the simplest balance relation are the geostrophic balance relations. So this basically gives you a derivative, uh, sorry, gives you the velocity from a derivative of your pressure field, give some constant at the front. This is the Coriolis parameter and the density of the field. Now this works pretty well for large scale systems, but it's not accurate enough for doing, well, high accuracy stuff, and also not accurate enough for doing small scale stuff. So what we end up doing, if we want to be truly accurate, is calculating a quantity known as PV, which acts as an intermediary and has, um, in a, a specialized case, has a balance relation associated with it. So the idea behind PV is, let's say we have an observed, oh, my own frame, yes I am, well done Simon, uh, observed velocity distribution, V, and we use that to calculate a quantity, which I'm going to call Q, big Q, so big it's just my own frame, um, which is the potential vorticity. Now, the formula for Q I will talk about in a second, but this encodes more information than V. So, yes, you need V to calculate it, but let's say that we already knew a priori what Q is. Then, in that case, we could actually perform what's called a PV inversion, which is what I talked about last time, and get our velocity field from it. But more than that, we can do that inversion and calculate the pressure, the temperature, and the density fields. So by knowing what your PV is, it's, which admittedly is calculated from this, but if you know what this PV is, and in particular if you're forecasting with it, which I'll talk about in a second, it's an incredibly useful quantity. It's got all this stuff bound up in it. It's just the question of accessing it. So what does this actually look like? So this kind of scary looking formula behind me explains what Q, potential velocity, is. We're going to work through this from left to right. I'm going to explain everything. Don't worry if you don't get maths, you are going to understand this. Kind of promise. So what this is telling us is Q, our potential vorticity, is proportional to this thing, C gamma. Ignore that. Proportional means that it's equal to this thing times a certain number that stays the same for any value of this. So that could be 5, pi, minus 1, whatever. Equal to with a constant, okay? C gamma, ignore this, ignore, ignore the man behind the curtain. C gamma is the circulation around the closed contour gamma. So, what does that mean? Right. A contour gamma is any contour, and a contour is just a closed loop. I have to be very careful that that actually closed. This is an example curve, which we call gamma, but it could have been that, or it could have been Ugh. 
<laughs> that. So that's what the contour is. That's what gamma means. It's just a no it's just a name. The circulation is a little bit more difficult to explain. Um, imagine that you have a pipe, right? And um, you fill it with water and you put a pump in it. So you've got water moving around your pipe, which is closed. It's going to be a closed loop. Then your circulation depends on the speed that water is being pumped around it and the length of the pipe. Now, and it, and it can also be positive or negative because the water could be pumped in the same direction that you define to be positive, like if you're looking from the top down clockwise or counterclockwise, or it could be negative, depending on your definition, right? This can be positive or negative. Now, the true circulation is if you take that pipe, but it's a hypothetical pipe that has um, the velocity of the fluid in it. Let's say you submerge it in, uh, actually, no, let's not put it in the ocean, let's put it in the atmosphere. Um, and the velocity of, the effective velocity of what would have been the water in the pipe, stick with me, is the velocity of the air at the place where you put it in the atmosphere. So if I had like a loop here, this is a still room, so the circulation would be zero because it'd be, it, it would be the effect equivalent of the water standing still. But if I put it up in the atmosphere, there's gonna be a wind blowing across it. And if there's like a shear to it, if it's blowing more across one side than it is across the other side, then the contribution from the side where the wind is stronger is gonna be bigger than the contribution in the, other, than, uh, in the other direction because the loops come back around of the other side. And that's the circulation, which we mathematically write as the closed integral. So the integral is when you sum over all the length of the pipe. That's all the integral is. The closed integral is just the fact that it's a closed pipe. We have a velocity times the elements of the pipe. It is in screen code. The lens is in the way of the screen. Really professional filmmaking. And the dx is the uh, length of pipe that you're considering at the particular point where you're looking. So the velocity is here. What well, the velocity is here and what the um, length of the pipe is here. It's a little bit, but the, the, if, you, if you don't understand that, don't worry. The point is, it's, it's the effective flow around your loop. Most cases though, you have like a really small loop, which is what we tend to do in maths. We tend to find these things uh, that can be arbitrary, make them infinitesimally small. And at that point, you can most like, you'll most likely have just a flow that goes from one direction, which means the circulation will be zero because it's an equal contribution along one side and then the same contribution in the opposite direction because you're looped back around and they're going to be zero. But if there's a shear to it, like if one side's stronger than the other or if there's even a reversal, you're going to get a large circulation that can be positive or negative. So this is just a number, which means that this is just a number as well. It's just, it's just like any old number, it will be positive because of the um, constant proportionality that we choose. So it won't be minus one, it might be five or pi or million and one. I was trying to think of something, but I remember one was the last column. So this is a number, which means this is just a number. So why is this all useful? Now, there's a property, which I haven't told you about this, which makes it useful. Hopefully this will suddenly become clear, but I'm explaining it, so it probably won't. Thanks to a Victorian physics formula, well, rather a, a law called the Kelvin Circulation Theorem, which states that the circulation around a loop in a fluid, where you allow the loop to be moved by the flow. So if, if I put it up in the atmosphere, I allow that loop to be blown along by the wind. And it can be distorted. So if the, if, if like, if the wind is going this way and then uh, on the other side of the loop is going this way, it can be stretched and pulled apart. But if you allow yourself to do that, if you allow your loop to be moved by the, f the fluid that's in motion, the circulation remains constant. And that's a very powerful result for PV. It's so, so useful. Might not be immediately clear why though. So let's say that we work out what Q is. So we, uh, in, in our bound, like our, our, the, the thing we're interested in. So this is our atmosphere. This square of the whiteboard is our atmosphere. At every point we calculate, given that there's some flow that's going on, say there's a flow that's doing this across the whole thing, right? The wind is blowing in that direction. That isn't actually there. This is a theoretical quantity. The wind's blowing across in this direction, say, and let's just say for the sake of argument that we work out at every point that our potential vorticity, that circulation, is described by this. So let's say it's zero in loads of places, but here it's large. Let's say that there was something interesting going on with the wind. I didn't draw the wind correctly, okay? Now, the circulation theorem tells us that if we blow our, our PV, our, our potential vorticity, or the circulation along with the flow, 
we know how that's described, right? If the flow, I've got to do this without actually erasing it. Like, let's, oh, you need to redraw it, sorry. If we, um, if we let the flow blow, say, this little bit of PV, let's just, let's just ignore the rest of it and say, that bit of PV is smudged that way by the wind. We know how that smudging takes place because we know what our wind field is. How? Because we know what our Q field is. We know at any given instant, if we know what Q is, we know what the wind is doing. Then we know how the, the, the Q distribution, this blob, is going to be squished and smeared and all that kind of stuff. We can calculate um, how much it's going to be distorted, right, in a reversible way. So we, let's say we know what the wind is at the start, at time equals zero, say midnight, we know what the wind is doing. Then we want to know what the PV distribution is going to look like at one o'clock. Then we take the wind at midnight and we let it blow across this distribution for an hour. And at the end of that hour, the PV distribution now looks like this. It's been smeared. Why is that useful? Well, remember at the start, from your PV, you can establish what P is, what your pressure is, your uh, density of the field, your temperature, and your velocity. So, effectively, what we've done is taken all these variables, well, really, it's just the velocity, is kind of all of them, bundle them all up into one quantity, that then it's easy to keep track of how it's distorted. It's distorted in a way that we can predict by the circulation theorem, by the material conservation of it. And then in the future, we, we then have a new potential vorticity distribution that we have calculated. And from that, we can predict what the velocity, temperature, pressure, and density fields are going to be in the future. So it's like taking all the information you have about the atmosphere, this whole state of the atmosphere, scrunching it up into a ball, and then you know how that ball is going to move, and you know how it's going to be distorted over time. Then you unpack all of it, and then you find out what the atmosphere will be doing in the future, given how long you allowed that your scrunched up ball to move around and be distorted. That's why PV is so useful, because we're lazy meteorologists and physicists in the atmosphere. We want to keep track of loads of stuff at once. But we only want to have to keep track of one variable. And we know how this variable changes over time in a very predictable way. That's why PV is useful. I made a hell of a mess. I'm really sorry if this section confused you, by the way. Um, it's quite advanced stuff. This was in my fourth year at Oxford, and I tried to kind of simplify this. Uh, if, you, <laughs> if you actually um, understood this, please comment, because it would be nice to know that I didn't just waste your time. And if you didn't understand it, please do ask, and I'll try and clarify anything. I'll, I'll include a reference, by the way, in the description. If you want to know more about this from a mathematical perspective, I'll include a paper in the description. But, for now, back to you in the studio. Me. Thanks. Me. Um, if you enjoyed that, I, which I hope you did, and you found it illuminating, I'd like to do these kind of videos a bit more in the future, where I do what my dad calls chalk and talk, even though, bless him, chalk hasn't been used for a while. Um, actually, no, that's a lie. My undergrad lectures were in chalk. You were right again, dad. But yeah, I'd like to do more of these kind of videos, and maybe um, in a, like a special video, which I, I, I'd, I'd link somewhere else, I might go through the proper derivation of the quasi-geostrophic potential vorticity equation, because I realise that most people watching this don't want to see that. Um, but if there's enough demand in the comments, then I will do it. So if you have any questions about PV, please feel free to put them down in the comments. I'll try and answer, though bear in mind I am not an expert exactly on it. Um, and if you also are a PhD student who are watching these and you haven't introduced yourself already, there were loads of you in the comments last time, by the way. It was really so interesting to hear like the, the kind of elevator pitch of what your research is. I love it. So if you're a PhD student watching this, or a master's student, you know, we don't discriminate. Um, please say, introduce yourself in the comments and say what your research is about. Um, and also if you have any suggestions about what you'd like me to do in these videos in the future. I have an idea for next time already. I've got a few ideas, um, but I'm always open to being told what you guys want to know about, because ultimately it's difficult to know what to cover when you're the one from the inside looking out. Really, from your perspective, I want to know what you guys would find interesting to know about. But next time I've got an idea which I'm going to try and run with and it might involve me wearing Hawaiian shorts. We'll see. I hope you found this entertaining and if you enjoyed it, please do like it. Feel free to subscribe to the channel for this and more vlogs and book clubs and all kinds of videos. I don't even know what I'm doing with this channel at the moment because frankly, the, this PhD is eating my life. But I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.